So good evening, everybody. To those of you here at the impressive Geological Society in the heart of London, and those of you joining us online, and a very warm welcome to the second part of the Chagos Conservation Trust 2024 Annual General Meeting. So whether you're a member of the Trust, a trustee, one of tonight's speakers, somebody who works with the Trust or for the Trust, or you are just interested in the work that we do and support, this is the second time that we have ever done an event like this, and it's looking like our largest turnout for a post-AGM event. So thank you all for attending. And for those of you who haven't met me by now, my name is Sarah Pontangalia, and I have been the Chagos Conservation Trust Director for two years, and this is our speaker event. So what does that mean? It means the speakers on the front row and uh, on your screen will talk for just 10 minutes on an area of work the Trust supports or is involved in. All is aimed at protecting and conserving the precious and unique environment of the Chagos Archipelago and the wildlife that call it home, which is at the heart of what we as the Chagos Conservation Trust charity do and why we exist. So each speaker will present from here and then return to their seat and then join me on the stage at the end for questions. So please keep your clapping and your questions till the end so that we can keep momentum with the speakers. And remember, questions from the floor must be directed to a specific speaker on what they've spoken about today. And for those of you online, you will be able to send a question by the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And like magic, I will be able to see it on here and then I can read the question out for you. So if you have a question for a speaker on a different topic or for the board or myself, keep it, grab us um, later at the reception. Um, and for those of you online, just send me an email. I also wanted to draw your attention to our hashtag. So if you guys are posting on social media, add that so I can pick it up and repost it. So before I introduce the first speaker, those of you who follow us on social media will know that we, together with the Manta Trust, launched a competition recently. And that was to name this beautiful female juvenile Manta Ray that graced the cover of this year's Chagos News, which if you haven't read it, please do. It's our annual publication, which is available to read on our website, and it's in the British Library. The director of the Chagos Manta Project, Dr. Joanna Harris, is one of this evening's speakers, and she and I conferred to pick a winner. And it wasn't easy. There were quite a lot of nice suggestions. In third place was Topper, after John Topp, who formed the trust, and that was suggested by a board member. Second was Grace, because they are such graceful creatures, suggested by one of our Facebook followers, Lorraine Palmer. So thank you to both of you. But the winner was Esperanza, because it means hope. And Dr. Harris will also explain why the Chagos Manta Rays need hope at the moment. So thank you to Gloria Brunette, who suggested the winning name, because there is a graceful ray darting around the Chagos as we meet tonight with the name you suggested. So I've spoken too much for now. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our first speaker, Dr. Pete Carr, currently our program manager and an ex Royal Marine commando who worked on Diego Garcia for five years, two as a British executive officer and then three as a contractor's environmental director before doing his PhD at Exeter University on how seabirds use the Chagos Marine Protected Area. And that's, a very, that's very fitting for his talk tonight about the birds of Chagos because it's the name of his latest book, which was published by the Trust earlier this year. He will also give us an update on our key rewilding project, Healthy Islands, Healthy, Healthy Reefs, which he leads on. So in brief, the project aims to rewild the 30 ecologically degraded islands on the outer atolls of the Chagos Archipelago, ret returning them to their natural habitat and boosting the survival of their seabird populations and supporting thrival communities. So tell us more, Pete. I feel bad about saying no clapping now. I feel like we should clap, sorry. <laughs> What's that, green button goes forward? Green forward. Uh, thanks very much, Sarah. Um, latest book, that, that sounds a bit fancy. This is a second edition of a first book. So I'm going to stand here for less than 10 minutes because I know some of my fellow speakers uh, will take more than 10 minutes. Uh, and to start with, I'm going to unashamedly plug um, this book which I've been told is more than a bird book. It's a little gold mine of environmental information about the Chagos Archipelago. Um, 
But first, I want to go back to the first edition. The reason being, no one ever asked me to talk about the first edition. <laughs> so I've got this opportunity now to say something. Uh, and I want to start with point four, that um, its genesis came on Ascension Island. I was flying back from the Falkland Islands. And if any, any of you have done the RAF flight from Falklands to Ascension, you get you, you change planes essentially in Ascension Island and you're put in a cage on the side of a volcano for about two hours. And I met this absolutely charming person uh, who was uh, on the RSPB's overseas desk. And over the period of a couple of years and two hours, she had persuaded me uh, to part to do this book on the Chagos Archipelago. Uh, and I said to her, well, I should be all right. I'll give it three months and that should all be done. And, and how wrong I was in that estimation because it took two years. The actual writing bit took about three to four months. Um, but getting all the photographs for the for the book uh, took a lot longer. And I was insistent, I wish I wasn't, but I was insistent that all the photographs were of birds that were photographed in the Chagos Archipelago. I had some, but I didn't have all. So what I did uh, as the XO, I was entitled to do this. I got a memo out to everyone on the island saying, if anyone's got any photographs of uh, birds, please pass them to me. I then had a little spreadsheet saying, yeah, I've got that one, I've got that one. And then I had about 10 that I was missing. And then I put out another memo saying, calling all photographers, can you help me get these last 10 photographs? Got them in the end. And, and it was in no small um, recognition of those four people who contributed at the bottom most of the photographs that went in the book. Um, it was one of a series sponsored by, or the first edition was one of a series uh, sponsored by the RSPB, and there was supposed to be one on all of the overseas territories. That hasn't quite happened yet. It's still a work in progress, but some of them are out. So let's have a look at what's new in the second edition. And the main thing is that uh, the, the first edition came out in 2011. Second edition came out last year, 2023. There's been an awful lot of science and re research uh, undertaken in the archipelago, much by these people in the front here, some done by me. Uh, the first three chapters of the second edition have been totally rewritten, and now they have the updated which islands are rat-free, which islands are rat-infested. It has the updated which islands are most important to the seabirds, and they've become uh, IUCN-listed important bird and biodiversity areas. Uh, and we've also identified a uh, marine important bird and biodiversity area centered around the islands, but also this important pelagic feeding area. So, so there's a whole suite of new science uh, going on in there. There's also a whole section on what the Healthy Islands Healthy Reefs program is about. I've got one slide at the end that I'm gonna talk about that will tell you more about that. And also, there's a whole suite of new species. In the 13 years since the first edition came out, there's been about 15 new species uh, to the islands. I think I've found about 13 of them. For example, that cotton pygmy goose, which is the thing on the right-hand side there, that's been hanging out on the uh, golf course lake. For any of you who've been to Diego Garcia for about the last five years, it's a lonely male. <laughs> Um, there's also been some changes in uh, the status and distribution of seabirds in the Chagos Archipelago. Uh, and, and unlike a lot of the marine science that you may be hearing about in the future, on the bird side, there's actually some good news stories. For example, red-footed boobies, uh, when the first survey came out, or when the first authoritative uh, census of seabirds came out, uh, red-footed boobies only nested on two of the atolls. Red-footed boobies breed on every atoll now. In 1982, for example, when John Top, the founder of Friends of Chagos, um, he did a census of, of seabirds on Diego Garcia, 82, there were three pairs of red-footed boobies uh, on that atoll. When I did the last census in 2019, there were over 11,000 pairs breeding on Diego Garcia atoll. Um, brown boobies, this is the, um, the what we call the football field on North Brother. It's got the highest population of uh, brown boobies in the central Indian Ocean. Brown boobies now nest on all of the atolls except Egmonts. 25 years ago, that wasn't the case. They only nested on one or two. So the book contains all these little snippets of information like that 
that you'll find nowhere else. But there's also been local extinctions. Um, and this is uh, a descendant of red jungle fowl, which is a true wild bird that occurs in Asia. Um, they have flown or somehow arrived. That was a joke. They, they've, uh, they've made their way onto many of the northern islands. Um, they were on Diego Garcia. They're now extinct. The reason why there's some poignancy to that or some reason behind that is that jungle fowl aren't good for rewilding islands. If you think, if you've seen chickens in coops, they scratch and they eat, they eat absolutely anything. So if you're rewilding an island and spreading seeds, you don't want chickens around. So we started a campaign in 2008 and by 2000, 2011, uh, chickens are extinct on Diego Garcia Atoll. It's all part of the start of this rewilding process. Um, so that's finishing up on the book. There's the details here where you can get it. I also have... <laughs> I, I thought that was funny anyway. Uh, I've also got copies of the book here with me today. So if anyone should wish to buy one, uh, 15 of your UK pounds will be sufficient. Um, and I do take promises of money being transferred into my bank. So I do have copies with me if anyone wants to buy some. That's the bird book bit. Um, I'm also the program manager for the healthy. Oh, no, sorry. Heather, I didn't know that you were going to be in the audience, so forgive me, but I'm not going to ask you to um, stand up and read what you wrote <laughs> as that lovely forward for me, but thank you very much for doing that. Um, and that's what the book's about and why it's improved in the second edition. Okay, so I'm also the uh, Healthy Islands, Healthy Beasts Programme Manager for um, all of the projects that make up what we're hoping to be um, the rewilding. And, and if there's any technical experts in the house, I know rewilding isn't the correct term, it's rehabilitation, but rewilding sounds much, much better. So just for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, um, it's, it's long been an aspiration to bring back seabird communities to the environmentally degraded islands in the Chagos Archipelago. There's about 55 islands in the archipelago and about 32 of them are environmentally degraded. What I mean by that is that they have rats on them, or I'm gonna put it in a different order. They have abandoned coconut plantations on them and any island that was farmed for coconuts historically had rats accidentally introduced. The seabirds and all other taxa that, that survive on these islands, uh, that, that's like a deadly combination. First of all, rats um, kill seabird eggs, eat seabird chicks, and eat adult um, seabirds. They also eat everything else like plants, turtles, hatchlings, et cetera. But I'm, I'm talking about birds. So, so rats and the seabirds just don't get on. Every island that had seabirds on it, that now has rats, essentially doesn't have seabirds on it anymore. But the double whammy is the architecture of coconut trees means that seabirds can't nest in them or, or very few seabirds can't nest in them. So things like frigate birds that have these big um, spindly nests or red footed boobies that have these stick nests, the fronds of coconuts don't support. So, so believe me when I say every island that has rats and coconuts does not have seabirds. A good island that hasn't had its vegetation changed and uh, doesn't have rats in the Chagos will hold probably 10 or 15,000 breeding pairs of seabirds. On, on islands, the biggest islands that were all farmed for coconuts, I'm lucky if I'm doing censuses out there to see 10 pairs of seabirds. And they'll all be things that nest individually, taking their life uh, in their hands up in the top of trees by themselves. Nothing nests on the ground on islands with rats. So that's, that's the history of it. Uh, and, and a little bit of the science is seabirds and seabird guano is really good for the island. And it's also really good for the surrounding marine ecosystems. And in these times of coral bleaching, uh, all of the habitats around the islands need every bit of help that they could get. Seabird nutrient inputs into these littoral ecosystems is a great thing that we want to encourage. So 2019, Chagos Conservation Trust was asked to produce at that time, 
um, a rat eradication plan for the archipelago. When I say the archipelago, stand fast, Diego Garcia. That won't get done. Technically, it's it's not it's not doable at the moment. It's too complicated. It's too big. So we we produced uh, we quite a royal we. Uh, we produced a, a rat eradication plan, which is a feasibility study uh, and environmental impacts, which was pretty easy, get rid of rats, um, and the operational plan. That was written. At the same time, scientists were doing research out in the archipelago, and we realised that you can get rid of rats on all the islands in the Chagos archipelago, but if they still got coconut plantations, the seabirds that we want to come back to get these nutrients into the coral won't occur. So the Chagos Conservation Trust took it upon itself to appoint someone, that happened to be me, to write a vegetation management plan, again, uh, an ecological impact assessment, a feasibility study, and an operational plan. So where we are with these plans is that all of the rat eradication work has been done. Two bits of the uh, vegetation management plan have been done. The operational plan has been done for Manuel and Yeye because there was a little bit of urgency a couple of months ago to get that done. Um, the operation will be, uh, plan for the vegetation will be finished by this August. So essentially what I'm saying there is that we are in a position um, to implement both of these operational plans whenever the politics and the funding and, and everything else that needs to come together uh, comes together and we can go in um, through the work of the Chagos Conservation Trust to implement and start the rewilding process of these islands. That was 10 minutes, wasn't it? 11, but I'm biased. Okay. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for, for listening. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, P. And um, for those of you who are members, you know, thank you for the money because it goes towards this project here. So um, most people don't realise that we publish books. And as Pete said, I'm going to do a shameless another publicity stand that Pete's book is available via our website. And he also has some books with him. So you can buy them and you'll do him a favour so he doesn't have to lug them all the way back to the Kent coast. So do grab Pete if you've got any further questions um, or ask them at the end. So... Moving on to our next speaker, who I've semi-introduced already, Dr. Joanna Harris, who's the director of the Manta Trust Chagos Manta Ray Project and a research fellow at the University of Plymouth. Her research focuses on the manta and devil rays of the Chagos archipelago, which she's been working on for the last four years. So Joanna, do you want to tell us some more? Thank you very much, Sarah. So um, thank you all very much for having me here tonight. So I'm going to talk to you about mobulid conservation in the Chagos Archipelago. So first of all, though, for anyone who hasn't heard of who the Manta Trust are, um, oh, you can't really see that on there. Anyway, so we are um, a charity that work for the conservation of manta rays and devil rays. Um, and we do that through research, education and collaboration. And we have a number of affiliate uh, projects around the world. So there was a global map there, but you can't see it on the now. Um, and I'm I'm the director of the Chagos Manta Ray project, so you can see geographically more or less where we are now there. Um, and so that's been going um, since 2013, but I took over in 2019. So I've been out there working um, with mantas. But mobulid rays are manta rays and devil rays. So until recently, only reef manta rays were known to uh, definitely exist when we had live records of reef manta rays um, in the Chagos Archipelago. But they are actually um, uh, collectively known as mobulids. There's 10 species, so two, potentially three mantas um, and seven devil ray species. Um, and they are closely related to sharks. They're filter feeding elasmobranchs. So uh, this is really, really broad stroke um, in terms of the biology of mobulids. They, they all have conservative life history traits. They are very slow growing. They don't have very many um, offspring. Um, so it means that they are, um, you cannot exploit this, this, any of the species at all. They have no sustainable level of exploitation um, that they can endure at all. Um, and in general, again, um, a lot of the species are widely distributed in, in relatively small geographically isolated populations. So all of them, all species are targeted by fisheries, particularly in the Indian Ocean for their gill plates. So gill plates are what they filter their food out from the water with, um, and they are promoted or marketed in Asian markets as having um, medicinal properties. 
Um, so a lot of the uh, fishers that target them, they wouldn't necessarily be using the meat. Um, they were just targeting for the gills. So they can often just be cut out and the rest of the fish discarded. Um, they then get dried um, and then they get sold um, in soups or they can be put in supplements and they're promoted to cure anything from acne through to, to cancer. So like I said, there's no level of exploitation that is that, that these, these um, populations can sustain. So it does, it's a massive issue for their survival and there have been local extinctions of populations of mobulids, especially in the Indian Ocean. So what makes the Chagos Archipelago so special is we have this huge great big no-take marine protected area where commercial fisheries aren't able to target them. So this really makes it a stronghold for the mobulid populations that are within the archipelago. So like I said, until recently, it was only reef manta rays we knew that were there. We've confirmed now that another three species, which is the sickle fin, um, it's, um, it's bent fin and um, spine tail devil rays that we've confirmed recently there as well. Um, but illegal fishing is a huge concern. In fact, because I spent quite a lot of time out in Chagos last year, and I was actually on the patrol vessel, um, when, if you ever look in the, the top right corner there, um, that's actually mobile gill plates. So that was a photo that was taken by the enforcement authorities, and it was just the photo in an archive that they had on that day, and no one even battered an eyelid, but obviously if you know what you're looking for, I, I noticed straight away that's mobile gill plates. So this kind of, like momented me to go and have a look through the rest of the archives that they had. There actually wasn't an awful lot of photographs, but these ones were taken from just seven vessels that had been intercepted and the catch photograph catches photographed. Um, there were 79 individuals in there, which equates to about 20 tons of mobulids that had been caught and not really even noticed because they've just been recorded as sort of ray catches or, or anything. So this kind of level of um, exploitation of mobulids um, would be detrimental to them in, if they're being targeted to this level within uh, it, just by illegal fisheries within the Chagos Archipelago. So this moves and brings me on to like a kind of the second part of my talk, really. So this is about the science behind mobile conservation. So until recently, it really was just the reef manta ray that we were worried about. And it was trying to learn as much about the population in the Chagos Archipelago as possible so that we can ensure that they're their conservation in the future. So there's a lot of things that we need to know, but mainly it's their movements and distribution and then their population size. So there's several um, techniques that I've used over the years to do that. Um, and there's photo identification, acoustic tagging and satellite tagging. So we're just going to have a look, quick overview, broad overview of what I've done with each one's, one of those. So um, in terms of uh, photographic identification, this is ideal for reef manta rays because they have a unique spot pattern on their ventral side. So it's as unique as a fingerprint. So if I photograph one manta and then photograph another manta later, I can tell you whether it's the same one or whether it's a different one. So that allows us to actually count and track individuals. So, so far I've managed to document 315 individuals within the population. We do know there's a lot more than that, but this is how many I've managed to, we've managed to doc, uh, photographically document with the help of other researchers that are in the room. Thank you all very much for your, for your images. And most of these have been documented at Egmont Atoll, which is in the southwest of the archipelago. So this is a real hotspot for reef manta rays. And so this has been the real focus of my uh, work over the past sort of four years. The thing is with photographic identification, you need to be in the field on a regular basis, able to take photographs regularly, which you really can't do in somewhere as remote as Chagos. So I've been using um, acoustic telemetry. So I'm sure most people might have heard of what that is, um, but it's really simple. Um, so the um, a small tag or a small transmitting device is attached to the animal of interest, and that device emits a coded signal. And then wherever you'd like to monitor, you install hydrophones, and every time that animal swims near the hydrophone, it records it as being there. So you can just record their movements and when they're there and sort of when they're not there. Um, so I did this for 42 reef manta rays for two and a half years, and this had over 300,000 detections of these mantas at Egmont. And I was able to look at their visitation patterns. And so this is my entire PhD summed up in one, in one slide, <laughs> because we are fished for time. But the take home message um, from the research was that 
Egmont Atoll is really, really important for manters. They actually spent up to 77% or a mean of 77% of their time there over the two and a half years. Um, they use the location all year round um, or a little bit more at certain times of the year, but they are there all the time. And one of the main drivers of them being there is actually something called the Indian Ocean Diapole. And we want, without wanting to get too in detail about what that is, basically at certain times when within its cycle, it causes there to be less productivity in this main Indian Ocean. And this is when mantas appear to flock to Egmont Atoll is when productivity is lower elsewhere. So it could be that they are really do rely on this location when prey resources are lower. So this makes it a really important environment, um, which is um, great because I, I managed to get it designated as an important shark and ray area, so an ISRA um, at the end of uh, uh, end of last year. So this is really great for um, marine spatial planning in future because it really highlights the area um, as a really important environment that needs to be considered during marine spatial planning. So. Obviously, identifying habitats such as Egmont is really important, um, but we do need to know about what other areas they use, and it's quite difficult to monitor them within the Chagos Archipelago. So what I've been doing recently, so within the last six months, is deploying satellite tags. So satellite tags record positions through the satellite system. So it means that once they've got a satellite tag on, you can go away and then you can download the data remotely to find out where they were. Um, and I'm doing this because I need to sort of find out where else in the marine, in, within the marine protected area they're using and where needs to be highlighted for both illegal fishing. And then if um, the MPA, if the use of the MPA does change in any way, what areas are highlighted to make sure that they have the protection that they need. So over the last six months, um, the 18 satellite tags that have gone out have um, delivered 3,500 uh, position estimates. Um, so you can see that they're quite they're scattered like almost throughout the archipelago. And then you use modeling techniques, which then estimate the tracks of those mantas. So you can see that they're swimming around quite a lot. There's a lot of activity. They're quite widely spread. What you can also do based on um, the swim speed and turn angle of the position estimates is estimate their behavior. So this basically the green dots are where the mantas are feeding. And so you can see Egmont Atoll is a really um, important or really active uh, feeding aggregation site. But other sites that we didn't know of before, um, it's down in the corner, we have Danger Island, um, the three banks underneath and also in the sort of south of the Great Chagos Bank. Um, and Diego Garcia is one we, we did know about, but sort of the other ones that we didn't. And so what's really important with e these areas is that um, Egmont's obviously been highlighted for need for conservation, but it's uh, ensuring that the same sort of measures that would be, you would hope would be translated into a, an, an ISRA would also be um, active in these areas as well. So for example, if we are looking at um, repurposing the marine protected area, it's ensuring that, um, there's speed restrictions for seagoing vessels to make sure that they're not hitting surface feeding mantas or they ensure that the no-take regulations remain at those lo locations with on-site enforcement. Um, and also maybe in the future tourist regulations as well. So, you know, it can be quite a big draw for tourists to ensuring that um, we mitigate any sort of negative impacts of tourism and preventing any development that would deliberately destruct marine habitat sort of dredging for boats and stuff like that. Um, in these locations. So these are brand new locations that we didn't know about before. So just in summary then, I know that was a real quick fire of like what's going on. Um, so acoustics um, and satellite telemetry have allowed us to have a look at the broad scale movement patterns and visitation patterns of reef manta rays. Um, and this is helping guide spatial planning. So for example, with the Egbon ISRA, um, and it's also uh, furthered our understanding of reef manta rays in particular, but this is really essential that we now repeat this for all mobulid species. So the ones that we didn't really know were there, we still don't know an awful lot about them, we're not sure what areas they're using in particular. And so this is really like my next mission and what I'm kind of like looking at now is how we can protect those ones that are obviously being targeted by fisheries. <laughs> Thank you, Joanna. That was great. And I think you can see why we chose the name Esperanza and Hope after looking at some of that very distressing imagery. 
So our next speaker needs no introduction, having been part of the CCT family for many, many years, <laughs> including being one of our longest serving trustees who kindly led our members tour at last year's AGM around London Zoo's Aquarium. So Rachel mm. Jones has been with ZSL for 27 years and has focused on marine species and conservation throughout her career. She first visited Chagos in 2006 and was actively involved in campaigning for its protection in 2010. She is currently the program manager for the Bertarelli Foundation's Indian Ocean Marine Science Program, coordinating more than 70 scientists working across the region, including those working on the project. Rachel will talk to us about tonight, plastic pollution. So please give us an update, Rachel. Like, no, it's the one you've all been waiting for. <laughs> Who cares about giant manta rays when you can hear about plastic pollution? <laughs> settle down, settle down. Um, right, thanks. For, for the last sort of three and a half years, we've been looking at the issue of plastic pollution in the Chagos Archipelago. So it's a rundown, really, of the things that we found, um, questions that have been raised, and what our next steps are with, with trying to address this issue. Obviously not an issue unique to the Chagos Archipelago, but those of you who have been there will recognize how awful the issue of plastic pollution on the beaches is. It's really, really extensive um, and it builds up in a way uh, that you don't see in many other places because in so few cases is any of this plastic cleared off the beaches. So it really accumulates. And we were starting to see these plastics get assimilated into quite deep sediments, um, get pushed right up deep into the turtle nesting uh, vegetation at the top of the beach. Um, some records of turtle entanglement, certainly where the female turtles are digging their nest pits and where the hatchlings are emerging is really the strip where the plastics are most, most sort of intensively aggregating. So this raised some questions about what, are, what is the overlap between the plastics and the turtles and what might the effect be of one on the other? Obviously, I won't steal anybody's thunder from later from talks later today, but a um, uh, hugely important area for turtle nesting. Uh, we've got hawksbill turtle nesting activity in the top diagram and green turtles in, in the bottom one. So you can see that with the, the, the regional distribution of turtle nesting, Chagos, the Chagos Archipelago represents hugely significant proportion of the turtle nesting activity in this part of the world. So what happens in this marine protected area really can have a meaningful effect um, on, on turtle populations. You know, hawksbill turtles are critically endangered. So we wanted to do three things. Um, uh, the first thing was to understand where the, turtle, the, where the plastics were uh, in, in density and distribution and how they uh, affected turtles. The second thing was to try and reduce the amount of single use plastic used on, on Dega Garcia. And the third thing was to address the issue of what you do with that plastic once you've collected off the beaches, waste managers have few options. Um, and this last point was really something that is not Chagos specific. This issue affects small island communities all around the world where they're faced with huge amounts of plastics, not of their own making without the infrastructure and the resources to deal with them. So the first thing we did was go out onto the beaches and try and understand where the plastics were and in what sort of density and distribution we use this method, it's an app called the Marine Debris Tracker. We ran transects all over the archipelago uh, and uploaded the data direct, directly into an open access global database. Uh, we published this paper, which summed up uh, the, the, the data that we collected in 2019, showing the distribution of plastic across the atolls and they were showing that there was some overlap between where the plastic was and where the turtles was. Um, and overwhelmingly, at least 60% of all the beach debris that we uh, assessed was, was plastic. So that's, that's a significant point. We then went to Egmont Atoll and looked at this in a bit more detail. We studied this tip at the top of Ile de Rat. There's this spit that goes out, this sandy spit, and it's really heavily used by turtle, uh, by turtle nesting turtles. So we went out in 2019, counted every single piece of beach litter on both sides of that point, both seaward and lagoon side, and right out into the spit. We then cleared the beaches of everything. And then we came back a year later and counted what was on the beaches again. So you can see that although obviously beach debris had returned and the proportion of plastic in the beach debris had actually gone up, which is interesting, but obviously not surprising because it's a highly mobile floating bit, bit, bit of pollution. 
um, overall, the signature of the beach clean was still there. So a year on, there was still the impact. We hadn't gone back to where we were before the year before. Uh, and that's useful information because that can direct us to, uh, to, to places and times where beach cleaning is, is, is most um, beneficial. We had a really good look at Diego Garcia Atoll uh, in 22. We did loads and loads of walking up and down hot beaches, counting bits of plastic. We surveyed huge amounts of beach debris um, uh, all the way around the Seawoods beaches and some of the lagoon beaches as well. And what we were trying to understand was on this particular atoll, hugely significant for turtle nesting, how much is the overlap between where the plastic is and where the turtles are nesting? And actually that overlap in some areas is really, really good. So on the left, you've got your aggregations of plastic. And on your right, from this paper from, 22, from 2020, you've got the intensity of the turtle nesting activity. And you can see in this southern stretch of the atoll, those two overlap, overlap really tightly, really well. So the physical processes that create beaches that are good for turtle nesting, and that's you know big, deep sand banks, are also the same physical processes that are drawing, funneling the plastic in um, and pushing it high up onto the beaches into the turtle nesting zone. And again, very useful information because on Diego Garcia, which is pretty much the only place you're getting any beach cleans done in the archipelago, you cannot clean all of the beaches all of the time. So you can target beach cleaning effort to the, pla the specific places and the specific times that have the most benefit to turtle conservation. Um, we also, uh, and Jess, who did this research, is in the audience, so ask her more questions about this, looks in a bit more de detail, specifically at drinks bottles. Now, drinks bottles represent a really significant proportion of the plastic that we're, we're finding on the beaches, water particularly, but drinks bottles in general. So we took data from Egmont Atoll and, and from Diego Garcia, and we had a really close look, or we, Jess had a really close look at the drinks bottles. And you can collect a lot of data from those bottles, from the labels, from the lids, um, uh, from the shape of the bottle. It can tell you a lot about where it was manufactured, when it was manufactured, when it, when it may have been sold. Um, and that can give you quite a lot of information. It can tell you where that bottle was was produced. Um, and this shows some, some sort of key offenders. Indonesia's top of the table by some way, um, not really surprising, sort of upstream of Chagos for much of the year, one of the world's biggest plastic polluters globally. So that's, that's not surprising. Maldives, not surprising, next nearest land mass, big tourist industry. That, that doesn't you sort of you know raise any eyebrows. China is interesting. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that in, in the next slide. Um, it also flags up who, who the baddies are in terms of who produced those products um, and what the products themselves are. So we're seeing Danone, Coca-Cola, here are the big names, here are the big uh, polluters, um, and Aqua Danone who, who they produce in Indonesia. So again, that's not surprising. Uh, and water out there in front of all those other drinks. Obviously a relatively recent phenomenon to bottle water, but it is the, the, the big offender and that gives us a real hook for some behavior change campaigns. So these sorts of data give us really uh, useful information that we can take on. The first thing is using models like this plastic adrift, Jess has been able to show that some of these bottles, uh, a lot of these bottles are very likely to have come from ships rather than from having come from mainland China and floated all the way to the Chagos Archipelago in the time that that bottle was, was, was manufactured. So that gives us information that gives us a hook to engage with legislative instruments like MARPOL and the new uh, UN Plastics Treaty that's in, in negotiation. We can talk to uh, people about extended producer responsibility um, and to the shareholders of these big companies that have environmental commitments about what they're doing to try and minimize their own impacts of their products on, on the marine environment. The second thing we wanted to do was to try and change the system of plastic use on Diego Garcia, sort of, sort of sm small aims. Um, the idea is in common with most other island um, communities, there's a lot of imported plastic, huge amounts of, of packaging used, loads of bottled water used, and we wanted to really try and change behaviour around single-use plastic. We ran this campaign, Hello DG, Goodbye Ocean Plastic, which was modelled on a similar campaign that we ran in London, um, and it really engaged people specifically around turtle conservation, because quite frankly, plastic is boring, and it really turns people off. 
everybody loves turtles and that was our hook that's what got people interested and the good thing about dg is you can see turtles any day of the week you can go out on a, onto a beach and see a turtle so it was a really effective way of engaging people and we had some good results we drove down retail sales of of bottled water substantially um, lots of people said they'd given it up completely um, outlets providing uh, tap water instead of bottled water and lots of people saying that they had engaged on this issue and changed their behavior about plastic use specifically because they were now concerned about ocean health and turtle conservation. So we really felt that that was a useful way of balancing, uh, balancing that request to change behavior and it was really, really successful. And the third thing was, well, what do you do with the beach plastic? By all means, encourage people to go and clean the beaches, but then what? You've got a huge pile of plastic. This is a, a drone shot of a, um, a pile of, of aggregated beach waste that was down at the Waste Management Centre for, for, for quite a while. Um, and this is, this is the, the, real, the real issue. What do you do with that plastic? Um, we've got lots of challenges on that front. We've got lots of it. And the more beach cleaning you encourage, the more plastic you generate. Um, this beach waste is not locally produced, so the uh, infrastructure on Diego Garcia is sized to cope with the plastic that they produce and use there. It is not sized to cope with vast amounts of ocean-borne plastic coming in with each, which, with each high tide. The plastic itself is in all sorts of conditions, generally awful. It's been at sea for sometimes years um, and has been exposed to high levels of, of UV, so it can be crumbly and in and very poor condition biofouling covered in contaminants um organisms so it's it's in a, it's in a real range of condition um the, it isn't economic to ship it off the island uh it is just it would just cost too much and there isn't anywhere sensible for it to go um and uh we, there, there just isn't the infrastructure on the island to be recycling individual polymers like a pet recycling plant here and an hdp one over here in the way that you could in a big city like london so that's just not feasible. So what we needed was a solution that um, would accept a mixture of plastics, would accept plastics in a range of conditions, generally poor, um, that could be operated locally quite, quite easily and would produce something useful. And we think we found a contender, which is um, a, a panel press, it's called, which produces these, these boards. So in short, you put 35 kilos of mixed plastic in one end, and out the other end, you get one of these, which is a big panel about the size and thickness of a plywood panel. And anything you can do with plywood, you can do with this with the added um, benefit. This is plastic, so it's waterproof. So plywood doesn't last very long in tropical marine environments, has a life expectancy of about 18 months to two years, whereas this will last a lot longer. The other good thing about this is it's completely circular. And if this breaks or falls apart, you can put it back through the system again, just chip it turn it into a new panel. So we're in the process of doing a feasibility study to see whether we can get one of these out to Diego Garcia, run it for a year, demonstrate its utility. There's the, the possibilities for what you can do with these panels is literally endless. You can cut them with a jigsaw, you can make furniture, you can do um, signboards, whatever you want with it. So we really feel that, that um, the cost of importing plywood to DG is quite high, that there's a real possibility to substitute these panels made from waste collected off turtle nesting beaches. So in summary, um, we found that there's big overlap between the beaches that are good for turtles and the beaches that are good for plastics. Um, microplastics and macroplastics affect, affect turtles um, and beach cleaning works. We can reduce macroplastics and keep those levels down. Um, it's important to target plastics during beach cleans and beach cleans during turtle nesting season to maximize the benefits of doing those things. Uh, we have data now to engage with brands and to feed into the, the UN uh, plastics treaty negotiations. Um, we've shown that using turtles as our link works, it engages people, it, get, it hits people in the heart and it gets them really thinking about their behavior. Um, and while plastic reduction has to come first, um, it's really important to help island communities to deal with a legacy of plastic that they have to face every day and that will continue to be coming for several decades, possibly centuries, no matter what we do upstream. Turtle, obligatory turtle shot. So we remember what we're doing. Um, that's it. Thanks to our funders and to your listening. <laughs> That's great. 
I'm um, sorry to put Jess on the spot, but Jess, would you mind standing up so people know who you are? Um, and then you can ask Jess. <laughs> because we're doing such a great job. So thank you, Rachel. Um, now we have a presentation on one of the most popular Chagos inhabitants, sharks. And we are lucky to have not one, but two presenters to deliver it tonight. So Dr. David Kernick is a research fellow within the Institute of Zoology at ZSL, where he leads the multidisciplinary um, ocean predator lab. David has been undertaking research on the Chagos since 2011, with the primary focus of better understanding the ecological significance of the archipelago for sharks, tuna, other large fish species and their conservation value. Uh, David is joined on stage by Dr. Claire Collins, who is a social scientist focusing on human dimensions of conservation and has been working on understanding the illegal fisheries in Chagos and its relationship to shark and ray meat markets in Sri Lanka and India for the past five years. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I will deal with the ecology side of it, and then I'll pass the baton over to Claire to deal with the more complicated socioeconomic side of the uh, So I get the easy part of the job. Um, I'll also say thank you to Joanna. She's introduced a bunch of the technology, so I can skim through this really quite quickly. But what I will say is I represent, I'm stood here today as the lucky one giving you the talk, but I represent a big team over the last years, very generously funded by the Bertarelli Foundation, um, who have undertaken this multidisciplinary project. And, Claire probably could have a whole other slide for her projects as well with additional suite of partners. And we've really all come together to kind of answer these key questions about what is the ecological value of this place for sharks and what is the conservation potential for protecting it if we can do a good job of protecting it. So as I mentioned, over the years, um, we've been doing a multidisciplinary program combining kind of looking at back at historical fisheries data, the art, working with the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission log uh, uh, fisheries record, logbooks, and IU data, but also a big acoustic and satellite telemetry program, um, which was the core focus of our work. And then spinning off the back of that, taking the opportunity that you are manhandling these sharks when you're tagging them to get some stabilized tether data, some DNA data too, and collecting some, you know, new eDNA, applying some new eDNA techniques to try and understand some of the, some more questions out there. So, the core focus of our work was acoustic telemetry. At its peak, we had 92 of these receivers around the archipelago, predominantly based in the northern atolls, um, but with a few around Egmont and down on the um, seamounts in the south. Uh, unsurprisingly, at the time, although Joanna's made progress here, DG weren't keen on having hydrophones around, the, around that atoll, so we never actually put any around there, but I know that's changed now. Uh, there's an asterisk on the manta ray because that number doesn't include the, the great work the manta trust did. But as you'll see, a key focus of our work was silver tip and grey sharks. For a long time, Chagos was one of the one of the few places in the world you could go and see an incredible, and as many people in this room will tell you, an incredible biomass of these predators, um, particularly silver tip sharks, which are quite a hard species to see in such numbers. So one of the key questions from this we wanted to ask to begin with is, is Chagos big enough? It, I mean, it's really big, right? So it's the same size as France. Is the Chagos MPA big enough to protect these species? So using the tagging data we had, the first question is, what is the home range of these animals? You don't need to look at the numbers, but orders of magnitude smaller. We're talking hundreds of square kilometers per for these species. So that's a good thing, right? For, so for both grey reefs and silver tips, there's potent conservation value there. They don't range far enough to get anywhere near that MPA boundary. So that's good. There's QR codes on all of these if you want to look up the papers. If not, come and find me afterwards and we can chat more. But grey reef sharks and silver tip sharks are very different. They look very similar. They look very similar. They're similar size and they coexist in this uh, amazing place in really high numbers. But their movement behaviour is very different. Grey reefs are highly resident. They'll stay around the same reef or the same atoll on pretty much the same island for most of their time whereas silver tips are a bit more adventurous and go offshore and feed more in the pelagic zone. And we've worked with uh, collaborators at MRAG to look at what impact this has on their risk to IUU poaching. And we understand that silver tip sharks, because of this larger, further foraging behavior and wider ranging behavior, 
they interact more with the illegal fishing activity and the threat level that we perceive in Chagos. A brief, a brief dalliance into other Telios, if you'll indulge me. But from the satellite tagging, we also, at this point, when this paper was published, the only animal we've ever tagged that of its own accord left the Chagos Archipelago in PA was this silky shark at the top, which headed on a very suspicious direct easterly direction. We'll leave that there. All the others, if you encounter all these, all their home ranges still within the boundary and still showing high fidelity to the Chagos Archipelago. Then this other silky shark decided to do the complete opposite. And at this point in time, this is the longest track ever for this species, headed about 4,000 kilometers and popped off off the coast of Kenya. So apart from silky sharks, which to be honest, isn't a surprise, they're highly mobile and really wide ranging. We think that the Chagos Archipelago is, archipelago is and the MPA that surrounds it, is sufficiently large to protect these animals, particularly at key life stages. And as, and as Joanna mentioned earlier, a lot of this information has come into the, is the IUCN Israel process to try and inform some of those key areas. So Egmont, Stromantas, and then we've also got the Peril Spanish Channel around uh, Vash Marine, um, have all been designated as, as ISRAs. And the Seamount complex in the south just didn't have enough data to get it over the line, but it's been retained as an area of interest. But unfortunately, Chagos is not immune to certain pressures, and mass coral bleaching is one of them. Now, Catherine Head's paper has shown that we've had about 60% decline in coral reef cover as a result of the 2015-2016 bleaching event. So there's an interesting question here that we wanted to look at is, how do these two shark species that coexist uh, sympatrically, and they have very similar you know, body size, how do, they, how do they coexist in the numbers that we have in Chagos? And previous work, we know that that's because the gray reefs predominantly feed on reef-based resources. And the silver tips, while they coexist in space and time, they will feed slightly offshore and feed on pelagic food resources. That's how they exist in the same space and time together. However, this is unpublished, but, uh, but data that we've been analyzing recently has started to show that since, uh, started to show that since the coral mass bleaching event happened, we are seeing a convergence in the feeding ecology of these two species. Gray reef sharks are having less reef-based food resources available to them, and so they are switching more to a pelagic diet. The ramifications of that, I don't know. How are we going to get more into specific competition? Is that going to mean we can support less biomass and predators of this size? That's a question up in the air at the moment, but it's an interesting observation that we're kind of only just starting to disentangle now. So as I've said previously, that we are confident that particularly for these reef associated shark species, the Chagos MPA is sufficiently large to protect them if we can do a good job of it. Now, over the years, it, this tagging plot is all our sharks pinging away on our, on our receivers. We would lose about one and a half tags a month. And that's through, you know, emigration away from the array, uh, natural mortality, tag failure, etc. Now, in 2014, we lost 15 tags simul nearly simultaneously in a couple of days, which was about 10% of our cohort of animals that was at liberty at the time. And this was attributed to a significant illegal fishing pulse that came through in, uh, in that period in 2014. We even had one of the individuals uh, try and claim the reward associated with the tag when they got it back to port. Um, I still don't know if a barb actually paid them, but uh, I highly doubt it. Um, so we know, so we, from our tagging data, we're detecting this threat. Now, <laughs> trying to get to the bottom of what that impact has been on the populations in, in Chagos is really hard. We haven't ever had a systematic reef shark survey, so it's hard to give you quantitative data on that. What we have been doing is doing eDNA work. Um, repeatedly across the archipelago. Now, if you take Diego Garcia as a, your control, a highly protected site, no illegal fisher in their right mind is going to go anywhere near that place, uh, as your control and compare that to the rest of the archipelago, it's somewhat concerning that we have a significant drop-off on the eDNA detections of both these species. Uh, and this was uh, around 2020, 2021 too. At the site level, if you take a drop, if you take a liter of water around Diego Garcia, you've got a 91% chance you're going to get um, gray reef sharks and a 75% chance you're going to get silver tips in that. That drops off a cliff if you go up into the northern atolls where 
uh, illegal fishing pressure is his wife, unfortunately. Mm. So this is the first attempt we've had at trying to quantify the ecological impact of this. Now, what is driving that behaviour, as I say, is the more complicated question. And at that point, I'll hand over to Claire. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah, like Dave said, I always have the fun job of understanding people and what they're up to and their behaviour. So the way that we're doing that uh, for Chagos is by combining data from enforcement of the MPA and with uh, community-based data, so mostly in Sri Lanka, but also in southern India as well. So, for example, what we've done is we've looked at, um, you know, where all the vessels that have been illegally fishing, what they've been targeting, where they've been found in the MPA. So, as you can see, those that are targeting sharks tend to sort of be aggregated in the reef areas, in the sort of shallow reef areas. And those um, that are sort of found in sort of the transit zone are the ones that are sort of targeting tuna. Um, and then when we were going into the communities, this is like 2019, 2020, and speaking to fishers, the kind of typical story that there was like a real segregation of uh, the vessel um, the vessels so those that were targeting sharks they had specialized gear etc and um, they were the ones that were going to Garcia as they call it so Chagos um, and they were saying you know this is a great time we can go there and we can fill our holds in like two to three days and we make loads of money and it's great and and that is really well suited to these long journeys as well because they don't need to use that much ice and also the the price of shark is is really sort of resistant to socio-ecological shock so unlike other um, sort of uh, tuners etc and um, they can always get a good price for it um, so this is kind of like the traditional story right we're talking about Sri Lankan vessels so from 2010 to 21 um, three quarters were Sri Lankan and these are kind of like typical scenes that you would see laid out in the dock so mostly sharks um, A and C these graphs here so that the yellow bars are Sri Lankan vessels and that's just sharks so as you can see primarily it's sharks in there and then green, the greeny color maybe um, is uh, uh, Indian vessels. So you can see that they're sort of more focusing on the reef fish. Um, so that was kind of like the typical typical picture. However, as um, some of you know, and some of you would be sick of me talking about as well, um, this changed during COVID. So we had a massive spike in activity. So um, the data is kind of saying that it, it went up like 20 times. So normally we'd have like one vessel suspected um, or like convicted of illegal fishing, but that went up uh, quite a lot. And obviously that's just kind of like the surface, like, you know, you get sort of anecdotal reports of people just on the BPV, just seeing lights everywhere. So that is just very much sort of like the surface picture. And, and the kind of two important messages from this are that it was, you know, it wasn't business as usual. It was switching from Sri Lankan to Indian vessels. So that's kind of concerning because their holds are like 10 times the size. Um, and also the other sort of, uh, thing to take from this is that we use two main types of data to kind of regulate, monitor, enforce the MPA. So that's data from enforcement, so visual sightings, etc., and SAS site data. And you can see the, the picture is completely different from those two different forms of data. So with satellite data, it's telling us there's like loads of Sri Lankans illegally fishing um, and that it's mostly around the border area. But the enforcement data is saying it's actually... Um, Indian vessels, and they're basically completely absent from the um, sort of satellite data. So really different stories. Um, so what does that mean for sharks and our underwater friends? So that basically, um, as I said, Indians of Indian vessels tend to target sort of a broader diversity. So this is kind of like a more typical picture of an Indian vessel. So a hell of a lot of reef fish and, and slightly less um, elasmoranchs or sharks. So um, that's sort of a that so that's a green uh, vessel from Tamil Nadu. So really helpfully they colour their vessels. So if you see them, you know you know where they're from. Um, so and then when we were going into the communities in Sri Lanka. And um, we did some stuff there last year. That was kind of the picture that was coming out was that like, you know, not as many people go to Garcia anymore. Um, and the people, the number of uh, sort of Sri Lankans engaging in shark fishing has decreased. So why has that happened? So yeah, it's, it's not really been like a quiet time in Sri Lanka. They've had quite a lot of uh, sort of uh, things going on. They've had several political crises. They've had sort of lots of economic instability. So this um, graph here is showing the fuel prices. So in 22, they basically shot up and you either couldn't get fuel or it's just so expensive. So lots of Sri Lankan vessels were just saying, you know, we just don't 
go that far anymore because it's not economically viable for us to go to like Maldives or um, Seychelles, etc. But also kind of like worrying as well. A lot of them were starting to say to us, like, we can't go there and fill our holds in two to three days. It'll take a lot longer now just because the populations of sharks have decreased so much. So that they're, they're looking, they have to spend a lot more time. So their sort of their cost goes up quite a lot. And they're starting to notice because these are all quotes from Sri Lankan fishers, they're starting to notice that there are Indian vessels catching like what they call rock fishes there, so reef fish. Um, yeah, and there's just not as many sharks. So what's driving the Indian fleet? So most of the Indian vessels are from Tutor, which is kind of like a group of like eight to nine village villages under what's called like Panyachat in um, Tamil Nadu, which is like a church basically. Um, and they are deep sea shark hunters. They're really super proud of their like sort of ability to go out and catch those sharks. They use specific long line um, sort of configurations. So if you see the like, specific type of long line, the distance between the hooks, you'll know kind of which village they're from and, and kind of what they're targeting as well. Um, so yeah, they, they've kind of been targeting sharks for a long time, but um, so this is within a trader and um, a fin collector in India. Um, and they were sort of saying that there's been a shark fin ban, we need to catch more sharks now, but also there's been a drop in shark populations in the other areas that they're going to as well. So that's why they're looking to Chagos. So um, so what we're trying to do at the moment, and this is kind of linking in with Joanna's work as well, is trying to understand a little bit more about what is like driving this, you know, shark and ray demand. So we starting to know a little bit more about the sharks, but the rays is still a massive question mark for a lot of these areas. So these, this is a picture from India last month and then Sri Lanka on the right this month. So we're doing what's called consumer choice modeling, which is trying to identify which attributes of shark and rays, like, you know, is it species, is it product type, is it the price they're being sold at, location, et cetera? What is influencing people buying them? And that can help us to kind of understand what's driving these fishers to target sharks, but also, as we know now, target rays as well um, in Chago. So that's ongoing at the moment. And then also we're doing work around management. So there is actually um, no agreement, no bilateral agreement in place with India at the moment. So when vessels are um, stopped in Chagos, they can't be prosecuted quite as easily as the Sri Lankan ones. And we think that might be influencing the rate with which they're targeting Chagos. Um, so we're looking at sort of management and policy in India and also at state level as well. So Tamil Nadu and Kerala. And then this is the last one. I said I'm talking really fast. Um, so um, yeah, this project was kind of uh, it's not it's, it wasn't necessarily just started because I saw um, one of the Marines had caught a juvenile hammerhead and I was like, oh, that's really exciting. Um, so this whole project was kind of started because of that. Um, but there's more reasons also um, in that um, looking at um, obviously this whole idea is that illegal fishing is you know um, not happening around DG like Dave was saying. Um, so it's kind of this idea of like maybe an MPA within an MPA um, and I'd get showing various pictures of like by caught sharks from fishes around there. So this project is going to be um, running for the next year or so and it's trying to figure out by using bruvs um, what species are actually around DG and kind of a population structure from, from the length of them. Um, and then also looking at gathering sort of local ecological knowledge for like where people are seeing sharks, um, what species, et cetera. And then hopefully potentially looking at, do we have nursery areas there and um, for what species as well? Hopefully some more juvenile hammerheads at some point. And that's it. Fascinating stuff. Thank you, both of you. Um, another institution that CCT work with is Swansea University from my neck of the woods and their marine ecology group, which I fondly call the turtle team. Their lead, Dr. Nicole Esteban, is a CCT trustee, who sadly can't be with us tonight. Uh, Dr. Holly Stokes penned an article on their research, which we published in last year's Chagos News. And Dr. Kimberly Stokes will be updating you on their work this evening. So Kimberly got her PhD in turtle ecology from Exeter University. Um, before becoming a postdoc at Swansea, uh, she worked at several conservation projects managing volunteers, including the Elephant Nature Park and Gibbon Rehabilitation Project in Thailand and the Marine Turtle Conservation Project in Cyprus. She also worked at London Zoo as part of the Edge of Existence Endangered Species Programme. So tell us more, Kimberly. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you.
Right, so yeah, thanks very much. Um, Chagos is really important for sea turtles. Um, there are lots of females come to Chagos to lay their nests. It has really ideal egg incubation conditions. Um, but more than that, it's the diversity of habitats that are within Chagos that provide ideal habitat across the very different life stages that sea turtles have. So it's actually quite uh, rare to have a place that hosts nesting females, foraging adults and juvenile turtles as well. So in this talk, I'll outline uh, the importance of Chagos in terms of sea turtle nesting and other sea turtle life stages. But I'll also try and describe some of the interesting research that comes out of having such a natural system to be able to work with um, to observe turtles living away from development and how that knowledge can then feed back into conservation to benefit them as a species. So um, this slide shows the sea turtle life cy cycle and it's made all the photos in the slide are from Chagos. So obviously you have the nesting females come to the beaches to lay their eggs. Later hatchlings will emerge and swim out to the open ocean where there are fewer predators. When, they're, uh, when they've reached a good size, they'll come into these shallow developmental habitats that you see in the bottom picture, um, because basically, again, they're escaping predation in very, very shallow water. Uh, when they're bigger again, they'll often use these deeper foraging habitats, so coastal habitats and submerged banks. And then when they reach maturity, they'll enter into this breeding cycle, uh, migratory cycle, where they're breeding between, breeding, sorry, migrating between breeding habitat and foraging habitat. And some of the adults in Chagos stay resident year round, so they're not migrating further away because there's foraging habitat and nesting habitat. And um, the vegetation that you see in this picture is actually really important for sea turtle nesting because it provides shade, which actually reduces the temperature of the incubating eggs, which is uh, really important because sea turtles have temperature dependent sex determination. <clears throat> and Chagos has been found to be one of the few places in the world that actually has a balanced hatchling sex ratio at the moment. Uh, because of this natural shading. Um, so Jean Mortimer and Nicole Esteban have been monitoring nest numbers across the archipelago since the 1990s. And they've shown that sea turtle nesting occurs across uh, every atoll, and also that nest numbers are increasing for hawksbill turtles and for green turtles. So we saw these maps earlier. Uh, but basically they show the importance of the Chagos archipelago in relation to the west, the rest of the Southwest Indian Ocean region, which is their genetic subpopulation. So the bigger the colored circle, the more nests are laid there each year. And um, you can see that a really big proportion of the nests for the subpopulation are actually laid within Chagos, particularly for hawksbills, which are the rarer species. So it really is a critical nesting area. Um, satellite tracking is used in sea turtle research to establish the connectivity between areas. Here you can see tracks collected over four research years where people were deploying satellite transmitters on uh, green turtles that had nested on Diego Garcia. And you can see that migration is predominantly westwards over to Africa, Mad Madagascar and the Seychelles. And the Seychelles government actually used these tracks to inform their MPA delineation. And this tracking also led to the discovery of deep water seagrass meadows at over 25 meters depth, which were previously unknown. And uh, this is uh, being verified through dive surveillance photo. It, it is, it's very <laughs> Um and all the hawksbills that have been tracked from Diego Garcia have actually stayed resident within the archipelago. And again, this tracking highlighted the importance of deep foraging sites, because all of these turtles were found to forage between 30 and 60 meters. So again, it's really surprisingly deep, and they're using these deep mesophotic reef ecosystems. 
Chagos also has some really extremely shallow habitat. So if you imagine how deep the ocean is around these islands and then how compared to how shallow the habitat within the atolls is. And then again, um, so for example, you've got Diego Garcia Lagoon here. And at the very southern tip, you've got Turtle Cove, which is a really, really very shallow part of the lagoon. It's around two meters deep or less in places. Um, and it's been found to be really important for juvenile turtles because they actually take refuge there away from the sharks that you get in the deeper parts of the lagoon. So um, these black lines in the top map show flight paths of um, where my colleagues were flying drones along transects to quantify the number of turtles. And the image below shows an example um, from some of that footage where turtles have been identified in the black circles. Um, and through counting the number of turtles through uh, the drone footage, they found that Turtle Cove actually hosts the largest immature turtle population in the world. This is an aerial photo of Turtle Cove, and in the background there you can see the really deep oceanic habitat where you'll find the breeding adults. In the foreground, this is basically the haven for young turtles where they can escape predation. Oh. And here, I'm just gonna tell you about one of our tracking studies in a bit more detail. Because this lagoon is actually one of the few places in the world where you can actually tag juvenile turtles relatively easily. A lot of tagging studies target <coughs> adult females because they obviously leave the water to come onto the beach to nest. So they're much more accessible. And those tagging studies are really important for population estimates, but those population estimates often overlook the males and the juvenile turtles because they're so much harder to monitor. Um, but here in Turtle Cove, the water's so shallow, you can literally pick them up out of the water and attach tags and transmitters and things. So here you have a juvenile Hawksbill turtle and um, you can see the flipper tag that we use to identify it attached onto the flipper tag. So it just clips on is a pressure sensor that we used for this study. And that tells us when we retrieve the tag, tells us how deep the turtle's gone um, when it's been in water. And these are a couple of example um, dive profiles. This is the kind of data that we get from these tags. So these plots show the depth through time and each of the U shapes is a single dive. And what these depth tags showed us from Turtle Cove was that the hawksbills here are staying underwater for a really surprisingly long amount of time, given how shallow they are. For example, green turtles, when they're diving in very shallow environments like this, around two meters, they will dive for between two and four minutes. And here we had turtles diving for an hour, or you know, in this bottom example, it's literally half a meter deep. And as the tide goes out, it's then 30 centimeters deep and it's still staying submerged for around 20 minutes at a time. And the reason that um, that shallow diving is actually kind of challenging for turtles is because if a turtle's very shallow, the air inside its lungs is, is going to give it actually a buoyancy issue. So what turtles do is they actually adjust the volume of air that they breathe in according to how deep they're going to dive to. So, this is a way for them not to be too buoyant and float back up to the surface. Um, so what that means is the deeper a turtle dives to, the bigger, the larger the breath it can take, because as it goes deeper, the air is compressed um, with that increasing pressure that you get with depth. Um, so this is the dive data that we collected. On the left, you have the daytime dives and on the right, you have the nighttime dives. And here, especially in the nighttime dives, you can really see that effect of the depth of the dive on how long the dive is, the duration. And um, <clears throat> this is just because they're able to take a deeper breath because they're having less buoyancy trouble when they're deeper. So obviously we wanted to compare what we found here with um, 
dive data for other sea turtle populations in other parts of the world. But the duration of a dive is really dependent on so many different things, including the activity levels of the turtle. So we went through all the published literature and found any example dive profiles that we could find. And we selected dives that had a comparable level of activity to our hawksbill turtles um, uh, by the shape when the dive is plotted through time. So we picked out the comparable dives and uh, basically plotted it um, by species. And when we put all that information together, we found that hawksbill turtles shown here in red are consistently diving for longer than green turtles and loggerhead turtles, which are in green and black on that plot, when you take the depth into account. And um, understanding these fundamental differences between species that are broadly considered to be similar really helps us to understand their ecology and movement patterns, which then feeds back into uh, benefiting conservation of each species. And this is just an example of the kind of um, special habitats you get in Chagos and how these can teach us about species of conservation concern. So thank you to my research group and the Bertarelli Foundation, and thanks for listening. <laughs>
But uh, one of the big issues with uh, Diving and Digger series, the damn sharks, and that's AI, by the way. Uh, uh, this was, uh, you can tell by the fact that my regulator is not fully in my mouth. Uh, there. Uh, it's quite difficult working with AI. I'm, I'm still on it at the moment. Uh, but that's what Diving and Diego Garcia is like. I mean, or it used to be at the very least. Um, and uh, at the end of uh, the expedition in 2020, there was this novel coronavirus coming out and uh, we basically had to abort our expedition on the very, very last dive that we did in, in Middle Brother. I found these, uh, these two uh, beautiful colonies kind of at about nine to 10 meters depth. And then we had to just kind of head, head, head north to the Maldives and if I remember rightly, uh, an alcohol-free flight back. And, uh, and the hostesses kept saying, um, we, we haven't got time to serve you and also it's dangerous for us with COVID, but they served us water every 10 minutes. I mean, that could have been gin, to be fair, but uh, I, I didn't want to say anything. Um, it's an edge species, so this is evolutionarily distinct and globally endangered. I can see Matt is squinting there at that. It's not Tonella. Um, we're, we're embarrassed for Zedicel's behalf that they're using a, a different coral there. But uh, yeah, and uh, it's also on the ICUM red list as an endangered coral, but currently with a couple of people in this room, we're having this uplisted to critically endangered at the moment, and that's going to be submitted in, in the next couple of days. Um, we're also simultaneously putting in a green list, which unlike the red list is all doom and gloom. Uh, the green list essentially says, what kind of conservation measures can we use to, to bring this species back up? And this is actually the first coral species that this will be done for. So it's a real template, a lot of pressure on us. I don't thrive under pressure, especially when it's a dry flight. Um, and... Uh, as you uh, may know from, from newspapers and the like, probably not the Daily Mail, but uh, certainly some of the more learned papers, we've been in a La Nina for the last kind of four or five years. And that's a, a generally a cool region of, of temperatures around global oceans. But uh, then we started getting reports back in April from NOAA that um, uh, this big El Nino was on the way, the first one in kind of four or five years. And this was going to be a, an absolute whopper. And, oh, that's AI. Um, I was in, um, is that AI? I don't know. <laughs> The only thing that gives it away, I think, is the is the airborne humpback whales. I think. Uh, again, I'm still trying to get to grips with this very nascent technology. I think, but uh, and the fact as well that uh, obviously customs won't let you fly with a with a dive cylinder on the back. I learned that straight after this photo. To be fair, um, yeah. So I was actually doing field work in the uh, in the Virgin Islands at the time, and uh, got this call from the the UK government that basically they'd funded this this incredible expedition to rescue. This, this species before the El Nino wiped out the very last colonies. And, uh, oh, another one, that's AI, by the way. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, and um, I think I've, uh, I probably made this joke last time, but uh, it surprised me. But uh, weirdly, there's a snorkel in my pocket there. And uh, only marine biologists can make that joke, to be fair. Um, and uh, so we assembled this incredible team uh, who uh, are all here at, um, they didn't get through customs, the kids. Uh, they weren't allowed on this trip. But uh, we met the uh, British government's patrol vessel um, in, in the Maldives and then had a very rough, very rough sail. We don't generally go out to the archipelago in kind of June, July, because the, the southeasterly trade winds are, are too rough. And, and it's beautiful to see some of my expedition mates here. Matt, for instance, who I didn't see for the first three weeks on account of him clutching his pillow and, and calling for members of his family. I think for most of most of that journey down uh, two, three meter swells, it was uh, it was feisty, to say the least. Um, so what I was basically doing was going out here and doing a population census. Um, it's very difficult to protect a coral if you don't really know how many there are out there. So uh, I was taking pictures of these corals and, and using kind of these 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter photo quadrats. And uh, this is actually a beautiful example because Tonella is known as actually quite a feisty coral. I talked about the hiding under the sand, but um, which wasn't true. Uh, but it also sends out these incredible sweepers that burn almost napalm the territory around it. And you can see this wonderful example here where it's actually kind of burnt away this coral that's that's kind of invading its territory. Um, oh, I should go back here now. There is a, I have a, an amazing RA uh, research assistant in the uh, audience here, Eloise, who uh, I'm, I would ask to stand up, but I fear she'd never talk to me again. And, uh, and I quite like her, so I'm not gonna call her out. But uh, if anyone wants to be pointed uh, in her direction after the talk, I can certainly do that, I think. Um, <clears throat> and she's actually working on all these images that I have and, and basically gauging the size of these colonies so that we can have an idea of how, how old they are and how many bleaching events they basically survived and how healthy that population is. Um, we did a bunch of other stuff while we were there. Um, this is uh, Heather Coldaway, who you might have mentioned. She's over there. I will call her out because it doesn't matter. Um, she, uh, yeah, and as I've said before, um, it might look like to some of you that she's diving, but she's actually just going, oh, for Peter's sake. I don't know why I'm here. 
Um, but they uh, essentially tracked, one of the ideas we want to do is model the entire lagoon and do like a, like a 3D digital avatar. And so you can do almost a Google street maps of this. And so people from all over the world can dive on this lagoon. For scientists as well, they'll be able to track it in high resolution and be able to look at the reefs and see how these are changing. Um, and this was what they came up with. Uh, <laughs> Again, I haven't applied AI to it yet. It'll look much better in post-production. But uh, weirdly, this looks like a, something from Sergeant Peppers, which for some of the younger members in the audience will be lost on them. But it was the Beatles' trippy LSD phase. Uh, we also installed a couple of um, uh, temperature loggers at the various extremes of this wonderful lagoon called Middle Brother, where most of these corals are found. And uh, this is really important because obviously we're, we're right in the middle of this El Nino event now. And we basically want to track this. And, and these things, I ask you every time, Joanna, what is it, once every second? once every second. So these are taking temperature readings once every second. And they're still out there now. And we're hoping to get out there at some point and, and pick these up and see how the temperature profile has, uh, has changed through this lagoon and how the corals are essentially getting through. <laughs> this lagoon that, um, that I've mentioned, Middle Brother, is, is, is a last oasis for these corals. We've got more corals here than anywhere else that, in the world, as far as we're in. This lagoon is tiny, um, probably a couple of times the size of this room, to be fair. Um, I was um, hacking off bits here to do some various genomic kind of shenanigans to look at population genetics and things like that and see one of the big things we really worry about is that um, as this coral is, is essentially we've lost 99.999 recurring percent of it over the last 20 years, we think due to climate change, one of the things we really worry about is the fact that we've lost so much genetic diversity that we haven't really got much left. Um, again, Diego Garcia, Southwestern Reefs. Oh, that's AI, by the way. Yeah. Um, it's a terrible place to dive. Big rollers coming in from the Southern Oceans. It's uh, shocking conditions, as you, you well know, David, as you well know. Um, so yes, uh, we basically took, this is the bike patrol vessel. This is Middle Brother I've mentioned here before, this incredibly unique um, out of the 50 odd islands in the archipelago that has its own essentially self-contained lagoon. This is the lagoon from above. I mean, absolutely stunning. And uh, this is one of our little ribs that we go out on. What we didn't know until we actually saw this drone footage was that um, basically these knolls, these kind of, uh, they're kind of like, kind of outgrowths of old corals that are growing upwards. The, the lagoon itself is only about 10 meters deep. And, and what we found is actually when we swam around these knolls, all of the tonella, these, these beautiful corals are grouped around the, the walls of these knolls. And so we went back to essentially count how many there are in this lagoon. And it turned out there were uh, 101 of them, which is just absolutely extraordinary. I mean, more than, again, at the moment, anywhere else in the world. So quite literally the last bastion of hope for this little species. Um, I told you they're feisty. I had to sneak up on them. Um, yeah, they tend to they tend to hide under the sand. This one badly placed. That's me saying boo to it. Um, again, one of John shots. That's not AI, by the way. That is actually me. Uh, yeah, and, and some of my colleagues, Ronan, refers to them as the cockroaches of the archipelago, which is is not true, not true at all. But it's difficult to uh, refute it because there were so many around. That's me as well in the back there. Uh, probably trying to find corals, and John was there going, it's right here. Um, and these are all John's shots, and, and John's an incredible photographer. And anyone wants to speak to him about, you know, some of the work he's done. I mean, really, it was uh, a unique opportunity to. Um, he genuinely made me look good, and uh, my father always said I had a face for radio. So uh, that was uh, that was some special special work you did. Um, oh, another one there as well. This is uh, essentially my my screensaver at the moment. Um, it doesn't quite look real, and this is on the floor of the gloom. Um, got distracted. Got distracted. Um, corals can be boring sometimes. And, uh, and so we were uh, collecting information about giant clams for some of our Mauritian colleagues to kind of foster those relationships in the, in the wake of our ongoing sovereignty um, talks. Um, so I uh, was collecting these corals to bring them back. The whole idea was to bring them back alive, to essentially save these corals. And um, what you can actually see here is that uh, John is swimming in front of me, um, you know, taking the shot of me. And, and John is, is an ex-Royal Marine and a very, very fit stuntman and swims at a rate of bloody knots. And uh, if you zoom in on my face, that's essentially a G-force of the mask against my, uh, against my eyes there as I'm trying to keep up with him holding this damn coral. But uh, luckily, AI came in, and this is actually what I thought I looked like uh, when I was there. Um, I'm not sure what those glass spheres are that I've got the corals in, but next expedition, I think that's what we'll be using. Um, one of the things we found when we brought these corals back onto our boat with these aquarium, these incredible, two of these incredible aquarists here at the moment in the August, um, to keep these things alive because the previous attempts hadn't managed to. They, they kept it alive for, well, I don't know. I mean, it died almost instantly. So I don't know if we can say they kept it alive. And when they lifted it out of the water, I think it was alive and that was about it. Um, and one of the things we found is that uh, Colette, who's here in the audience, had a beautiful little UV torch in her. And I'm not entirely sure why, but uh, one thing we found is that these corals fluoresce. 
And corals fluoresce, essentially. They have green fluorescent proteins in them. These protect them from, from bleaching and UV light. And so this is a really interesting thing to find because this coral has been hit really hard by climate change. And one of the reasons we think this is that um, it's just really bad at, at harvesting the energy of the sun. And so it sits in the most shallow depths. And then essentially, as we get these warm water events, it's, it's a sitting duck. Um, so this is why we think it, uh, it might be dying out. Um, we basically collected these. Oh, this is our, our missing member, Christoph, who um, beautifully, uh, when I described him to a member of the team that was looking for him, said uh, he looks like a member of a French circus that might weightlift. Uh, he had a twirly moustache, and he still does have that. Uh, Matt here as well, looking, um, I don't know, angry, tired. Of course, we'd been awake uh, 25, 26 hours at that point, hadn't we? Try to collect these corals and bring them back. Um, this isn't their natural state. They don't like to be outside um, of the water. And uh, we're packing these away in these boxes here. This is the uh, very romantic, nostalgic back deck of the, the Biot Patrol vessel. This is our laboratory here, uh, which is something else. And um, these were packed in a way. And, and Jamie, I think, is in the audience here, I'm sure. Where is he? There he is as well. So the success of this mission essentially would not have been possible without the Horniman Museum and Gardens. And, and, and Jamie here, and I'm going to regret saying this, but uh, we have one of the world's greats in terms of keeping corals alive and, and quite literally the only person that we could turn to to make sure that this species stay where it was. And, and he did this extraordinary job. And that's the only shot you get, Jamie, essentially uh, pointing at those corals there. But uh, those corals are actually now thriving. We've actually fragmented those corals and moved them to, to London Zoo. And so there's now a little population of those as well, just in case the worst should happen, Jamie. And, and something, I don't know, goes wrong with the coral system or something like that which that's a little inside joke there, but I'll share it with you. Um, Jamie, unfortunately, lost almost in his entire coral stock at the museum going back five, 10 years. And the only aquarium that survived was the Chagos coral. And, and when he told me this, I had to probably very badly feign that look of, 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 of upset for you. Because the only thing I really cared about, of course, was the Chagos corals that we collected. And, and these are the only ones that actually remain. And, and the beautiful flip side of this now is that Jamie only focuses on those corals. And so they're getting uh, some amazing attention that would be distracted by the less memorable species if his, uh, his corals were still around. Um, this is the team, Tanella. Um, yeah, it was, uh, I couldn't ask for a better team of people, um, apart from maybe the, uh, the crew who only ate meat three times a day, battered highly. Even the salad was battered, to be fair. Um, and uh, these are the organizations that helped me get through this, uh, this amazing project. Um, Oh, oh, this is me. Uh, yeah, um, that's my details. Uh, this was a, a squall. I don't know if anyone, I think Joanna was on this. Yeah, squall hit us in the middle of the ocean, didn't it? And uh, I lost I lost a t-shirt that was very precious to me, but didn't because uh, Brett had hidden it and then told me. But this was me lamenting the loss of my t-shirt. Um, oh, what do I have to do now? So just to explain the new fatherhood, um, and this is all, again, all thanks to, to Jamie and Matt and the guys at the, the Hornemere Museum of Gardens. I think we flipped to a no, video. The, the video is going to come, Stefan. Here we are. So this, is, um, this happened just two weeks ago, and you, you are an incredibly elite group of people that know this. It's a very small group of people that actually know this, but um, these corals under the, the beautiful care of the Hornemere Museum actually spawned, and this is an absolute world first. We, we had no idea how they spawn. Corals have different reproductive cycles. And, and um, it's, it's happening. It's not, a, it's not a still. It's actually, um, and these little baby corals are swimming, swimming to the sea, and they don't realize how incredibly precious they are because they are the world's rarest coral. And now in the, the wonderful hands of the, the Hornemy Museum, we, we, and London Zoo, and soon to be Monaco, the World Coral Conservatory, we actually have basically saved this coral from extinction. Where we go next is um, a conversation I'll have over some wine after this talk. And uh, thank you very much for listening and sticking around for the last talk. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you, Bri, for that inspirational talk. Um, and I just want to say thank you to John as well, who you mentioned. So John is a fantastic photographer and videographer, and it's your images that we use in Chagos News on the website, and we're eternally grateful. So I just want to give a clap to not just John and Bri, but everybody. Um, thank you all for your talk. We've gone hideously over time. The bar is, you know, not going to be open forever. So um, before we clap you, I might recommend that if you have questions, you grab the speakers by the bar rather than putting them on stage. 
and anybody um, who's got questions online, I'm sorry that you're not here for the bar, um, send them to me and I will divert them to everybody. Um, however, <laughs> if you just permit me um, a little bit more time, um, I know I'm standing between you and wine, but I just want to thank you guys for coming, the speakers, and ask you if you can, you don't have to, if you want to become a member and help us continue the project that Pete's leading on, then Chris Davis here, who is, by the way, our new chair, <laughs> um, please go and see him. He's got a, a little machine and he can uh, sign you up. He'll be in the foyer as well as Pete's books. You can also donate. Um, and a final thank you from me and all the board. Um, well, my thank you from me to the board for all your help this year. And I just want to thank those who are leaving us this year. Um, Amy Smith, Rachel Jones, Rachel McGough, who, saved, who served brilliantly as both treasurer and secretary, and Dr. Natasha Gibson, who's at the back, who has handed over the chair reins to Chris tonight uh, with Dr. John Turner becoming our first deputy chair. Thank you, Natasha, from all of us for everything you did for CCT. We truly appreciate it and we hope that you stay a member and enjoy coming back next year with no work to do. So if you um if we can just clap everybody and say thank you. <laughs> and then a few more teeny thank yous. Thank you to Alistair Gamal, who's always my wise owl for all his advice, Chris for helping me with the invites and manning the tables with Ken, James Clark, our treasurer who gives way too much time to his role and keeps me sane. Pete Carr, who also keeps me sane, but you're simply brilliant at everything you do and I couldn't do my job without you, thank you. I also wanted to welcome Pascalina Nellen, one of the Chagossian community members, but she can't make it tonight. Uh, she's joined the CCT family to manage the Chagossian community website that we've got funding for. So do look that up because it's not just for the community, it's for everybody to learn more about the community. Um, so grab me if you want the, the link. And also the USCCT uh, team, people don't really know they exist, um, but they're there and they're watching online. So thank you to Ted Morris, and who's the chair and secretary, Lottie Perkis. And also lastly, the Geological Society for letting us um, do our event here. It's been great, um, especially to Stefan, the AV guy up there, thank you, and Louise. So now let's go to the foyer, have a drink together toast the trust and its work for the past and hopefully the next 31 years. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You can stop recording. <laughs> Guys, can we have a quick team photo?